Okay, welcome back to this uh, afternoon session of the uh, EPIC workshop. Uh, really excited to um, introduce Dima uh, and the colleague David Bean. They are going to talk about a sort of extension of the annotation of, um, of EPIC kitchens. Uh, and this is a really revealed session. Is a uh, new stuff are coming with these big data sets that, that uh, now that the community uh, is using as a standard. So let's see what, what we can do more with the Epic Kitchen data sets. Thank you, Dima. Thanks, Giovanni. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm introducing with David and with Bin a collaboration of three universities, Bristol, Michigan, and Toronto. We've been working on this project for a couple of years, so I'm actually quite excited and emotional a little bit to be able to present it to you and hopefully get feedback. Uh, the data set is presented today and will be public by before the 1st of August. Um, right, so what is the project? And let's start with the numbers. We have more than 270,000 manually annotated segmentations of hands and active objects. And these have also been interpolated into more than 10 million uh, interpolated and filtered dense masks, which you'll be able to see some examples of later. And these are 36 hours of Epic Kitchens, of which we will be releasing 30 hours for train and Val and keeping six hours for testing for now. Um, of these, if you work in video object segmentation, so we're talking about data sets like Davis, YouTube Boss, etc., we will be uh, releasing a little bit shorter 12 second on average sequences, 7,800 temporally consistent sequences, particularly for video object segmentation. So let's get an example of what we've annotated. This is one image of Epic Kitchens annotated based as part of the visor um, annotations and benchmark. And I'll take you through exactly what we have. So you can see that we clearly have the link between a semantic label, particularly for the hands, the left hand, and the right hand, semantically annotated. For every other object, we have the semantic name, hob, saucepan. We even have things during transformation, like the spice being added, the spice container. You can see the spoon, which is currently partly occluded, the soup, and the container lid. So these level of annotations are also associated with some sort of hierarchical knowledge. So for every entity, we have the open vocabulary name. We have a closed vocabulary class, so from saucepan to say pan, as well as a macro class or category like cookware and that exists for every entity we have in the data set because we're building on epic kitchens we by default have the action associated with every class so that is coming out of the epic kitchens annotation so with the um with the annotated image we have the action label we also have and david will talk more about that we have the knowledge of what is the hand doing whether the hand is in contact and which entity is it in contact with in the single individual image um, so again, we also have additional annotations that might be useful to people doing segmentation, because as you can see, the, not, we haven't annotated the full extent of the, it's not every pixel in the image, we focus on what we call active objects, but we provide flags of whether the entity has been exhaustively annotated, like all spoons in the image, or there are other spoons that are non-exhaustive in that particular image. Let's take another example so you can get a feel of the single image annotations that have been manually created. Again, this wasn't easy to collect, particularly in this example, understanding that the left hand is in fact in contact with the knife while the right hand is in contact with the sponge. There are a lot of details that you'll hopefully researchers will find interesting in the data set. Because this is collected from uh, Epic Kitchens, we have all sorts of naturally collected interactions. You can see examples of people picking stuff from up there as well as um, dealing with all sorts of tools and hand objects. Okay, so this is the single image, but we also have the temporally consistent knowledge. So this is a short sequence. You can see the legend again, which we now know how it works, but you can see the same, the same action being temporally consistently uh, tracked as while the person is actually um, taking the action, in this case, adding cheese. It's always confusing when you see because we've colored stuff up. So this is in fact cheese, and you can see that cheese being added to the pan. Not only we have these temporally consistent short sequences, we have epic kitchens, we have untrimmed long videos. So you'll be able to see the same thing over long and long minutes 
um, it's the length of the video. So in this case, you see the person preparing flour. So we start with a pan. We start with an actual flour being added to the pan. Um, and I am coloring the timeline with what I recall the state of the object. So you can see in the first stage, you have the flour being added, then salt, then yeast, etc. And at a certain point, this stops being flour as you see the transformation to this being a mixture that includes water and other things, all the way to the fact that you can see the dough being formed, kneaded, and left to rest. So we have these temporally consistent long sequences. Right, let's look at some stats. Um, visor compared to its predecessors in video object segmentations. And we want to highlight that this is really not, it's best, it has more masks and more minutes, but what it also offers is this long temporal knowledge of objects being transformed, which don't exist in data sets like Davis or even UVO, which have been collected from uh, kinetics. We also have these total minutes that we've annotated an average length of sequence. And I put a mark here because the average length of the video is 12 minutes. But we have these sequences that I'll explain a little bit later that make it directly comparable to Davis and YouTube Boss. We also have the comparison between pixel level annotations. We will be releasing the largest number of masks manually annotated. We have on average 5.3 masks per image, a little bit less than UVO. But critically, what we have is all this combination to actions action classes and entities. So there hasn't been a data set that not only has all these, but is also associated with actions, with action classes and with entity classes. So what have we done? This is what we started with, Epic Kitchens, which I'm hoping many of you are already familiar with. What we have is a timeline, we have start and end time of actions, and we have images associated with these actions. So the quest first question we had to ask is, what exactly are we planning to segment? What frames and what entities? And we started with asking what entities. So we looked at the narrations and extracted a set of automatic things from the labels. So if you're sharpening knife, hopefully you need to extract the knife. All this exercise is to give us the list of things that we plan to actually annotate. This wasn't enough because if you have like stir food in pan, clearly there are other things like the spoon that, you, that is involved, but that's not part of the narration. So a large amount of the exercise was finding first some rule-based obvious things if you're washing, probably there is a tap and sink. And all of these are the list of entities we asked the annotators. It's an overcomplete list. We asked the annotators to again go and segment. We also went and looked at individual instances because even for the same action, assume we are talking about peeling an apple, like it could be a knife you're using, it could be a peeler, it could be something more complex. So we had to go through the exercise of understanding for every instance, what are the set of active objects? Right. Again, we had that now for the full of the data set. So for every action, we know what the active objects are. But to be comparable to data sets that focus on video object segmentations, which typically have around 4.5 seconds in length, if we gave them 12 minutes, I think that would be a bit extreme. So we started with dividing our sequences into something that is more manageable for people who are doing video object segmentation. Noted that YouTube VOS is on average 4.5 seconds, Davis is three, and UVO is also three. We're still making a big jump here because our average, what we call subsequence is 12 seconds. And we form these by dividing our videos into what we call subsequences, taking three non-overlapping actions. And that's what forms a subsequence. For every subsequence, for every action, we randomly select with some rules that we specify two frames per action. We were very keen to select these frames accurately to avoid motion blur because that really significantly impacts the clarity of our boundaries. And we have six frames per subsequence. These we call our sparse annotations. And I'll show you how we transform these into dense annotations. So accordingly, we have these six frames per sequence and these form our sparse segmentations. Like this example here, Again, this is sharpening knife. You can see both hands. You can see the sharpener and the knife, and you can see the chopping board, which are all action relevant, but you don't have any knowledge about the rest of the pixels in the image. They are not action relevant um, objects or instances. Similarly, we have objects that have a lot more, like stirring the food in the pan, where you have the hob, the pan, the two pans, the spatula, etc. So the number of active objects changes drastically per objects. The next question was how to segment. 
and we needed to come up with a list of interesting rules um, that are consistent and interesting and will work for other people. For example, do you want to segment only the hands, the hand and the arm? How do you deal with the watch? We had to try all these sorts of things. For example, in this case, for the hand rule, we ask people to segment all the visible part of the hand, including the arm, ignoring things that the people are wearing like wrists or handbands, because otherwise that will kind of give a break that we don't want for this particular case. Then the next was to focus on what we call the container rule. So in this case, you are selecting an object from the fridge. So the fridge was fully segmented, including all other objects inside the fridge that are not part of the action. So we didn't want to segment those out because then it doesn't look like the full fridge. But if the object is action relevant, in this case, it's a butter package, then that gets segmented out. So we call this a container rule. We have rules of how to deal with tiny objects. So in this case, you can see that we still are interested in all these tiny objects that are being cut and transformed. But in the case where, you know, it's impossible to separate stuff like, you know, the noodles inside the pan, then we were not interested in internal edges. We also have a very interesting case as things change their name. So in the first image, you can see that the person picking up a package. So what we've labeled is the butter here because it's a pick up butter and the butter currently is inside the package. But as the package gets opened, that you can see the, the semantics changing, right? What's inside now is the actual butter and what you've labeled is now transforming into purely a package. So all of these are things we've worked carefully to actually make sure that they are accurate and consistent. We've relied on uh, the Toronto interface, the Taurus interface that is AI enabled. Um, and you can look at um, the work for more details. And that really allows people to annotate more accurately and then very quick because of this AI enabled tools that are part of this interface. Right, we also in, um, in the paper, which will be available shortly, we compared the annotator agreements, making sure that they're consistent based on our rules. Similar to Epic Kitchens, this is long tailed. So the Y axis of masks that we make available is log scaled. You have a lot more of certain things than others. Uh, and again, we provide the closed vocabulary as well as these macro classes. And you can see the instances covering all sorts of utensils, cutlery and foods and furniture and appliances, etc. We also provide some understanding of the interaction between actions and objects. Of course, there are strong correlations between certain actions and objects. You're washing next to the sink, you're cutting with the knife and the chopping board. But we also show that there is also a diversity in the types of objects associated with actions. Right, having understood, let's look at some of our sparse annotations. So you can, as we said, these are two frames per action, focusing on active objects, over time, consistently, semantically annotated, allowing us to see things like the person picking stuff from the thing, throwing stuff away, getting the peeler. And for me, that's always the most exciting when you see things transforming, like the peel appearing separate from the object, object and the objects being cut, washed, etc. If you're familiar with Epic Kitchens, um, then you know that we do have that diversity and that continuous annotation. This was the starting point to produce dense annotations. And we do that by taking two sparse annotations. We have a trained model that allows us to interpolate. And then we assess the quality of those interpolations by starting from the middle frame. So we actually have both a forward and a backward um, set of tracking annotations. We combine these using the logit softmax. And after that, we start from the middle frame and we try to reconstruct the manually annotated frames. This is a way for us to understand whether these interpolations are actually good or not. So we can directly compare and we filter these based on two scores, based on the J and F scores. We only keep those filtered ones, which we will make available. These are 72% of all interpolated objects. I'll show you now from the sparse, moving into the dense, what we can achieve with visor. So these are things that I think people like me who have been doing action recognition for a while, uh, I get super excited when I see this level of annotations because I don't think we had anything comparable, but you can see the exact transformations of objects out of these dense annotations and they were 
really possible because not only we have the spars, but because of the way we sampled the videos into actions. I'll leave you with a few of these. So you can understand what type of things we'll be able to share with the community soon. And you can see the transformation here between the butter and the butter packaging, the person reading from the recipe book, and then basically cutting stuff and producing these butter slices that are being um, weighed. Remember, all of these are associated with action labels that we're not plotting here, but you know, we know what the person is doing. Let's see another example. Things might appear and disappear depending on when they become action relevant. Right, moving from the visor annotations to three challenges that we're gonna open, similar to your familiar approach of how we open challenges with Epic. And there are three of them. I'll introduce the first and then pass on to David and Ben to introduce the other two. The first is a standard semi-supervised video object segmentation. The assumption here is that you have a fixed number of masks in frame one, and you aim to track them until the end of the sequence. These might go out of view or might be fully occluded, but you're only tracking what's available in the first frame. And in this case, there are interesting challenges. So we have in our validation and test set some unseen kitchens, and we have on average five objects per sequence. And these vary in length, as we said, um, the number of generally they vary between, um, between being one object to up to 13 objects. Some of the results that showcase how this data set compares to other video object segmentation or image object segmentation. If you're training on Coco, you're doing fairly okay on large objects, but quite terribly on small objects. If you train on YouTube, Voss and Davis, then again, you can see the gap between visor annotations and what has been available, particularly as objects change transformation. I'll hand over to David, who's gonna talk about hand object segmentations. Thanks, Dima. So the goal of the hand object segmentation challenge is to characterize what hands are doing. And so by that, I mean, we want to be able to detect and segment the hands as well as handheld objects, and also recognize the side of the, object, the, side of the hand, left versus right, contact, whether it's in contact with the scene or not, as well as which object. And the, if you've seen this before, and you use some of our earlier systems, um, this is, you, you might recognize this as, we're not trying to name the object, but we're simply trying to put a mask on the object. All right, sounds better? Cool, all right. So we're trying to put a mask around the object, basically indicate no matter what its name is, just generically what the object is. So it's the object that's in contact. And I think Epic Kitchens is a great place to be doing uh, understanding hands in contact with objects because in Epic Kitchens, hands are doing lots of lots of exciting stuff. And so if you look at what they're doing, if you have a sort of a histogram of stuff, about 40% of our data consists of two hands engaged in interaction with two different objects. And so this coordination, um, about 30% is one hand just off by itself doing something. And excitingly, about 20% of the data are two hands coordinating to do something. And so there's tons and tons of contact in the scene. And the sort of what's left of the data set is primarily like scenes where only one hand is an interaction. And the amount of data where nothing's going on is actually quite small. So Epic Kitchens is a very busy place for hands, which is quite exciting. And as Dima said, it's also an exciting place where there's a very long tail. And it's also connected with the Epic Kitchens, the existing Epic Kitchens labels, as well as semantics. So for example, we know that knives are extremely common in the kitchen and people use knives a lot. So large fractions of the data happen to be people use knives. This is great. You have this example where you have tons and tons of samples of the same object being used in lots of different ways. And so here are some examples of the knives and these are actually prediction system. And I'll show you a video a little bit later on. And you can see this is actually quite nice. There's also though, a long tail of objects. And so there are lots and lots of objects that you touch once or twice a week at most, maybe once a month. And you know exactly what it is. And so there's this tremendous long tail of objects that you have to recognize. Things like foil rolls, this plastic ring, this is really, really tiny and small. And yet the person is holding this. And so there's this long tail of objects that makes this challenge quite difficult. And so we have some challenges and some baselines. 
And the baseline is very similar to our 100 days of hands object detection system. And the idea here is we have point rend to do instance segmentation. Um, and we have additional detection heads that help it recognize the hand side and the hand state, as well as an association between the hand and the handheld object. And so it's basically a, an object detection system. And this is a baseline. And then it does, does fairly well, but there's lots of room to improve. And so I, I'm like looking forward to people coming up with new innovative ways to improve on this data. And the other task that we have is active object segmentation, or can you recognize the active objects that people are interacting with? And so for example, in this part of the, of the recipe, the person isn't, for example, interacting with the, uh, the salt on the left. And so this is just simply recognizing and segmenting the objects that have been labeled in our data set. So this might be useful, for example, for intelligent assistance. So this is uh, quite a bit of a challenge. Let me just briefly show you a video, and these are predictions of our system. Um, and so here's the output of a system. Someone's putting the spoon in the, in the bowl. And so as you can see, you have the left hand and the right hand. Left is in blue, right is in red. And the object is in yellow. And it's doing a relatively good job of segmenting the system. This is validation data. It hasn't seen this video before. And yet the segments are actually quite nice. And this is in large part due to the fact that segments that it's been trained on are extremely accurate. And this is, again, this is our baseline system. And I fully anticipate that people will be able to produce even better systems. So let me just talk briefly about evaluation. Um, it's going to be Coco Segmentation AP. Um, and the categories are hands. And you can divide them up different ways, left versus right, in contact versus not in contact, as well as objects. And the, that's basically it. We don't explicitly uh, evaluate the relationship between hands and objects. We do this implicitly by saying, OK, every single contacted object you detect must have some hand that explains it. And so it's just straightforward Coco Segmentation AP, though. And for hands, the segmentation AP is really high. So on the test set, it's something about 94%. This is, of course, a held out test set. So on the validation set, you'd hit something like 90%, which is really, really accurate. If you also required to get the hand side correct, it drops a little bit to like 86, but this is still extremely high. Now, what's exciting is all of a sudden, contact is quite a bit more difficult. So the AP there is down to about in the 70s. And so getting the hand contact state right is very hard. And so this is exciting. So there's lots of great room for improvement. And if you look at segmenting the objects, it's even quite a bit harder. And so the exciting thing is that about 33% is right in the sweet spot where if you want to use our data, there's lots of great things you can do with it. This is very useful. But on the other hand, if you want to improve on this, there's tons of room for improvement. And actually recognizing which object is in contact is hard, as well as segmenting it precisely is very hard. And this is because there's such this long tail thing where large fractions of your data you see once or twice at, at most. And finally, of course, doing active object recognition is quite challenging because it's, you have to understand the, the full context of the scene. And so this, I suspect, will be a very interesting challenge. And so that's it for uh, hand object segmentation. So I'll turn it over to Ben for where did this come from? Uh, thanks, Dima and David. Sorry. So uh, given a frame in, on tune the video with a mask, indicating the uh, query object. We aim to chase back in time to uh, identify where did this come from. So in this example, the query object is an onion. So based on our common sense, the onion may come from the fridge, may come from the cupboard, or even from the bag. So we can see a reverse video to find out the answer. So as you can see, uh, the, the onion is changed according, uh, across the videos and it can be cut it. It can be, you know, uh, also it can be cut it and also it can be uh, transformed into two different ways. And also uh, we can see actually it is from the cupboard. So uh, actually the most important thing here in this video is that we need to find the evidence of to identify it, where does this come from? So for this task, uh, there are two goals. The first goal is to predict the source of the query object. Uh, the second goal, that is the most challenging part, is to spatially and temporally ground the evidence frames when the query objects emerges from the source. 
So in this example, we can see the gap between the query and evidence frames is more than 18 minutes. So to solve this problem, it is really, you know, you need the model to really capture the information of this kind of long-term reasoning of the object relations. So we can see more examples. In this example, the spicy jar is from the cupboard. In this example, we can see the egg is from the bridge. And in this example, the plane is from the cupboard. As you can imagine, it is not easy to annotate this kind of long-term objective relations. So in total, we have annotated 222 examples from 92 untrimmed videos. Among other examples, we have 78 unique query objects. So in this figure, we can see actually, we have a very diverse query objects. Let's say for the oil, we have uh, seven examples. For the milk, we have eight examples. And also for the trackability, uh, we used 15 sources that it shows the query object emerges from. So here we show the distributions of the source classes. As you can see, the fridge and the cupboard occupy a large portion of the sources. Well, maybe for this kind of package or box, it's less common in this annotations. And also we show the gap between the query and evidence frames. You can see uh, actually many gaps align within two minutes, but also we have a roughly 20% of the data are longer than 10 minutes. So on average, uh, the gap is 5.4 minutes with a high variation. And also the shortest duration is just one second. So it's kind of very short, but for the longest one, it can be up to 52 minutes. So in this sense, actually, um, we really need some uh, big model, uh, good models to model in this kind of uh, long-term relations. So among all the examples we annotated, we will just form it as a test set. So we really encourage self-supervised method to adjust this task, where does this come from? Yeah, thank you. So I will hand over to Dima. Thank you very much. Um, we will have space for questions, but we're presenting this on behalf of a large team from the three universities. The release, as we said, will be on the 1st of August for further information on the data set, code for baselines, and the relevant publication, please go to Epic Kitchens slash Visor. But if you have any questions in the meanwhile, we would be happy to take some. Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank you for the really great work and I can't get can't wait to get my data to be better. Uh but actually one thing that brings up on both. The thing is you said that you had a you change the notation of the object when it changes space, right? When you mix the flower and yes. so how do you define when to do it? Yes. All the offices like this, but how how do you define it? Yes. One of the interesting aspects, I, I'll just bring my plug to while I talk. One good thing is we rely on the explanations that have been provided at Epic Kitchens, but people are talking about what they've done. They've given us lots of clues about when something changes name. So you would see in the examples, the person saying, add the flower, and then they would use the term now mix, like change the mixture, right? So we have those transformations. The difficult thing is to actually connect them spatially temporally, right? And we've done that via these consistent, consistent categories. They're not fully consistent. And at times there isn't really an exact moment 
at which something changes into something else, right? So that boundary, there is no guarantee that it's fully accurate, but there is a point in time where this is certainly a slice and it was certainly an onion. But we've heavily relied on the narrations because this is what people have used to describe those transformations, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Correct. It's when people basically start calling something something else, basically. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, this is for the you can read all uh, the total model analysis without estimating the total of the analysis because there, there are a lot of false positives um, because of the price perspective and uh, of the dealing with it. Yeah, I think I think this is something I'm very interested in as well, which is what can you actually get? How far can you go from just an image and how far can you go just based on 2D stuff? And I think the answer is, I mean, based on what the humans are able to label, maybe humans are able to do it okay, but they might be using a 3D model inside to just to figure out this is not a plausible one, this is a plausible one. I think what will be very exciting is there are lots and lots of these really challenging situations in Epic Kitchens compared to say, holding larger objects. So I think this might be an area where like 3D type stuff might shine because you might have to explicitly reason, okay, I can, I can, see, the, I can see the hand, I can see part of the object, and there must be some object which generates these small number of pixels and maybe the pixels by themselves are not distinct, but you know based on the hand shape and based on what the person is doing, what, what the object should be. So I, I think this will be very exciting to see. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, another thing is, for example, when you upload the uh, unpacked photos, yes. uh, the, if it's set, then it's uh, just the butter. Yes. If it's unpacked, yes. then the internal content of the butter. Correct. Correct. Uh, Correct. So it's going to require some context, like a uh, temporal context. Correct. Uh, like understanding the fact that uh, the the butter, the the heavy butter, is butter. Correct. It's just the uh, package kind of that can be in the same shape without the butter. It's just the package. Absolutely. And, and I can give you like loads of those examples. What you pick out of the fridge is called milk until you open it and pour something from it and then it becomes a bottle and what comes out of it is the actual milk. It's mad. Yes. Correct. Uh, when does, uh, when, for example, in case of the butter, it seems kind of natural or then the, the, the boundary is kind of Probably much better defined. Correct. But in case of the milk, if you pour it, uh, and then uh, half of the bottle is still full, how do you how do you have to take that or what the Yeah, so so we have specific rules for transparency and non-transparency, whether we can see still what's inside or we can't. Uh, but at certain points we're focusing on the role of the object in the action rather than so we basically are relying on what you call something, right? Okay. But yes, things are changing really shape. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the egg and the eggshell, right? So you pick something from the fridge, it's called an egg. Everybody's happy with it being called egg. And then once you break it, that is no longer an egg. What comes out of it is the egg. And what's in your hand is now called shell. Um, there is a lot, I think the kitchens introduces lots of complexity. At the moment, we're giving you exactly the name you would call something at every point in time. And the links are really interesting to build for people. I think that was a final question or? Yeah. What do you mean by a system? Yeah. The, so you propose the task and then it's someone I don't think we're targeting systems. I think we believe if a model is capable of answering that question, it has a very good temporal, spatial temporal reasoning yeah. as a model, right? But I don't think we're targeting a particular 
a particular system as such. So we're targeting models that are able to do a lot more than what we currently can. I don't know whether there was a final question. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this was a very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. As we said, we have clear distinction between transparency and non-transparency, right? But we really relied on lots of work that has been done before in semantic segmentation. For example, if you have, you know, two cars next to one another, right? One is occluding the other. You are not really annotating what you what is invisible, right? So in this case, every pixel has a single, a single label, and if something is occluding something fully with no transparency, then yeah, the pixels of the soup are soup. And what you can see of the pan is purely the pan. Thank you very much. And I guess we can hold, we can give it back to the next. So, and looking forward to your feedback once you have this in your hands.